welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet lighthearted. Podcasts share their career-defining drug, song and book, and also share their joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. For this episode, we're joined by Professor Alf Collins. Alf is NHS England's Clinical Director for Personalised Care. We will welcome Alf in a moment as he shares a drug for our formery, his career anthem, and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. For our micro-discussion, we continue our look at the recent article in the Sunday Times, The NHS is Flatlining, Here's How to Save It Right Now. Before we go any further, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries, STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Welcome both. Evening. Evening. What have you been up to? I'm em- embroiled in pre-holiday planning at the moment, so um, I can't I can't really think. It's been a busy couple of weeks, and then um, I'm in that pre-holiday panic phase. I'll give you a couple of quick ones then. A couple of negatives, and then a very, very big positive. So a couple of negatives, as in personal negatives for me. I got feedback from two people who are avid listeners of the podcast. One telling me off that we men- I mentioned Amazon as to where to get your books from and that we should be pushing local booksellers. Apologies for that, Sarah. I got some good feedback from Liz Lamerton, who's a renal specialist pharmacist who really, really enjoyed the Deborah Duval episode, but said that I, with too much glee, said, take note to secondary care when Deborah was talking about how she didn't think that they were listening to her views about her own life. And the big positive, and it couldn't have come out a better episode for us with ALF, because hey-ho, it's not just thrown together, is Dr. Julian Treadwell, GP, an academic who's been working apparently for six years on this. And this is this new website called gpevidence.org. And it is fabulous, darling. And I'm sure we're going to talk about it later. But basically, there is your, you know, where to go for good evidence that puts into patient decision aid. So smiley faces, risks and benefits it's fabulous. Very good. Gimmo? Yeah, like I say, not much. We went on a date, didn't we, last time? We on, did. On, <laughs> on Saturday. S- S- STC <laughs> went up to Scotland to watch the rugby, yeah. so Gimmo and I sneaked date night in. We had a little podcast summit in oh. Cardiff while he was away in Scotland. We went to TEDx Cardiff, and in, in between one of the... Uh, one of the speakers, they asked to speak to somebody in front of you. And so the lady in front of us tapped on the shoulder, said, oh, you have to speak to us, sorry. And I, and so I asked, I said, if you had to give a TED talk, what would it be on? And she replied, patient safety. No. She did. So a big shout out to Marlene Perez Coleman, patient safety and environmental advocate, Argentinian plastic surgeon, moved to Wales, resilient and resourceful is how she describes herself. Ooh. So yeah, we had a great conversation with Marlene and it was lovely to meet her. That's just up from positive and pacey, that. Yeah. So what would your TED talk be, Steve, if you had to give a TED talk? I'll come back to you on that. And then look, from me, maybe a first for the oral apothecary, but I've been sent a gift. What? Hang on. I sent you a gift. No, 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 no. From a, from a, from a listener. Oh, Can you oh see hang that? on. Can you see that? Is it, Do you know what? Is it a Tom Jones-esque type? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So thank you to one of our super fans, Pfizer, who sent me an orange peeler. Don't even ask. Well, no, Pfizer's my friend. I, well, yeah. <laughs> but, you know. uh, anyway, um, look, congratulations to Oral Apothecary alumni, Dr. Pete Turton, who I saw on social media has just got his consultant post. Uh, yes. Congratulations, Pete. Absolutely. We took him all the way as an anaesthetist there. And then, look, finally, before we welcome our guest for tonight, thank you to our listeners in Belgium, the Philippines, Estonia, Mongolia, for keeping us bouncing around the charts in those countries for the last five or six weeks. Or oh, Ulaanbaatar. We'll be going there for the next live show. Your support is much appreciated. Let's move on. Look. Are we allowed to mention that we're off to Lisbon? Oh, yeah, we should. Go on, then. We're off to Lisbon. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, you know the name of the conference, Steve. So you yes, you so the, details. the European Association of Hospital Pharmacy have invited us to do an oral apothecary live at the EHP conference this year in Lisbon. So, if you're going to be there, check it out. Very good. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Colin, Alf Collins, the oral apothecary. Alf was a community consultant in pain management for many years, and in parallel worked for a decade with the Health Foundation, helping lead applied research and implementation programs in person-centered care. He has researched and publicised widely on all aspects of person-centred care and has a particular interest in changing the relationship between patients and healthcare professionals. He has honorary fellowships from the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of General Practitioners. 
and a visiting professorship in healthcare policy at Coventry University. I've had the pleasure of welcoming Alf to speak at a couple of conferences. One was from a studio in Bristol during lockdown. The other was at last year's Prescript Conference in November 2022. Welcome to the podcast, Alf. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to be here. Such a such a delightful company to be with at um, quarter past eight in the evening. Lovely, lovely to be here. Thursday night pod, Thursday night pod. So, Alf, look, changing the relationship between patients and healthcare professionals. How's that going? Slow, slow but sure, I, I reckon, actually, Jamie. We've been talking about it, haven't we, for decades, actually, this stuff. And I remember 20 years ago when I was really kind of getting to grips with this changing the relationship stuff. And I was getting a bit down about it. But I do think there's many, many, many more of us now talking about it. There's many of us knowing it's the right thing to do. Um, in policy terms, it's, it's I think, probably as high a profile as it's ever been, certainly in England. Um, and I think we do some good stuff generally across the country. And I think pharmacists, I would say this, wouldn't I, on a, on a podcast led by pharmacists. Not a pharmacy podcast, though, Alf, OK? Not a pharmacy Thank podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for reminding me that. I think you probably are leading the way. Pharmacists probably are leading the way, actually. Physiotherapists, pharmacists, nurses, probably. Doctors, yeah, possibly not so much, uh, with some honourable exceptions, of course, of course. Yeah. Why do you think that is, Alf? Well, we've got our heads stuffed full of knowledge, haven't we? I think, I think especially doctors, we like to pride ourselves in, in how much we know, really. And, and, and actually, we feel it's our duty, you know, if we're being person-centred, to tell patients all the stuff we know. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is probably gets in the way of us developing a genuine curiosity to know more about them. Of course, there's honourable exceptions. It's a, a vast overgeneralisation, of course. But, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of research that, that tells us that doctors probably struggle a little bit more than, than other healthcare professionals to work in a, in a personalised, person-centred way. So so I've sort of been involved in, I say teaching, that's probably not the right word, but, but running a few sessions on shared decision-making. And actually, I think using some of the King's Fund stuff that, that you were involved in, it was the King's Fund, um, No Decision Without Me, um, and one Hang on a minute. Things... We should just make a very big, not just because Alpha's here, because that is a seminal piece of work. Yeah. So for listeners, and the reason why you might think I thought we were having patients and advocates on in this series, well, we are because you're going to have no better advocate for all of you than Alf Collins. So Alf Collins and Angela Coulter are the godfather and the godmother of shared decision making in the, in the UK, and their King's Fund document from 2011 which was called Making Shared Decision-Making a Reality, No Decision About Me Without Me, is absolutely seminal in everything that anybody ever says about shared decision-making. Let the guest speak now. Well, that's <laughs> lovely. That's really <laughs> lovely. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we wrote that 12, 13 years ago, didn't we? It's funny, isn't it? And, and we are getting there, though, aren't we? People like Nadine Montgomery, you know, it took her years to go to the Supreme Court to actually get the Montgomery ruling. And, and I think she's done as much as, 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 as anybody, actually, to, to, to change our perception of the value and importance of shared decision making. It's there in, in, in GMC guidance. It's there across all the professions in terms of their statutory regulations. But, you know, I, I don't hear people now saying, oh, no, that's not a very good idea. People generally say, yes, of course, important. And then they say, yes, of course, and I, I do it. I do it. And, of course, we know that perhaps not everybody does do shared decision making as well as as well as we might. Alf, just for the non-health professional, could you just very, very quickly explain the, the, the Nadine Montgomery law? Because it is important. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it used to be the case that when we sh when we. Um, we're signing a consent form to proceed to a, a surgical procedure, then it was incumbent upon the clinician, it was called the Bolan principle, to tell patients what a reasonable clinician would tell a patient about the benefits and harms of the procedure. Um, and uh, Nadine Montgomery, it was, a, it was a dreadful case. I won't go into the detail of the case, but, but it was, a, it was a, a, a maternity case which 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 really didn't go at all well. And she argued that actually it was her that ought to be making the decision about how much information she would want to have herself to make a decision about what she what, what's called in legal terms a material risk, a significant risk. 
but it was only us as, as, as individuals who really know what a significant risk is because we kind of make sense of it in terms of our own context. So it turned the Bolam case on its head and the Montgomery principle is now that, um, that we should tell patients about the benefits and harms of procedures that a reasonable patient would want to know, not that a reasonable clinician would want to divulge. So it's turned it on its head. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alf. So sorry, Guillermo, I know I jumped in, but you were going to talk about you were doing some teaching about shared decision making. Well, no, it was it was, it was more we, we were musing, weren't we, on, on what impact this had. You know, that paper was 10, 12 years ago and, and there was stuff before that. I just remember, it's always stuck in my mind, one of the things that used to come back for, for people at those sessions was, you know, people were generally in favour of the principles. They were always worried about the time and effort that was involved in, in doing it and how they'd fit that in to what was then a busy sort of schedule and now is even busier. And I often, and we used to try, we used to say, well, if it's done right, it will save time and and, and it's it's better for the relationship. So I just wonder if that's true. If, if, you know, is it easy, is it, is it easy to do, you know, or have we slightly missold it in terms of, you know, it is actually a more difficult process. It's just more worthwhile in the long run. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the evidence is reasonable that it probably does take five to seven percent longer. That's 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 um, what the Cochrane Review um, from a few years ago said. Um, when, when I was part of the Health Foundation, we ran a programme called Magic. Where, where we, we in, in, in that it was a big quality improvement program. And, and what, what we demonstrated there was if, if patients, if people know stuff up front, so if they're given decision support tools up front, if they're encouraged and supported to think about what matters to them up front, you know, either in the hospital letter or when they see the receptionist, when they walk into the, into the, into the waiting room or when they're waiting to the, for, the, for the online conversation to happen, if people are prepared, start to understand what their options might be and start to think about the questions they might want to ask, then that actually does kind of reduce the amount of time that's needed to do it really well. So you have to actually change the way you do processes in the service to do it. Yeah, and just to add to that, as you guys know, being a clinician that I am, and I've had a couple of excellent consultations today, actually, that really detail what it is that we're talking about here. Because having spent seven years now working in primary care, having spent 25 years in secondary care, and bemoaning some of that stuff in secondary care, because I always used to say, well, I didn't really get to know the patient. And, you know, they're not in their own habitat. You know, I was thinking today as I cycled home, it's a bit like an analogy with a zoo animal. Okay. So if you're if you're the patient in the hospital, you're you're not in your own habitat, are you? So you're going to do what your keeper tells you. Whether you th and the keeper thinks that you, the animal, are complying with what you, the keeper, are doing. Well, that's because you hold the keys, quite literally, <laughs> to the compound. Whereas now in primary care, I feel that I'm seeing those animals in their own habitat. And so it's much easier to have these conversations because the chances are that they're really going to tell me what they think because, you know, they're in their own environment and their own values and preferences can come through. And hopefully that that analogy makes sense. Did you check that I, analogy with anybody before coming on? No, no. That's literally how my brain works. About an hour ago, I came up with that. I, I think you quite liked it. Anyway, what I wanted to say was that the other thing I've noticed in, in primary care is that, and again, there are always exceptions, aren't there? But I find that when I have to prepare, okay, now I do get half an hour appointments because I'm dealing with people with multimorbidity and lots of medicines like 10 plus. But I... I challenge anybody to be able to have a shared decision making process without some preparation of, of what you know about that person before they come through the door so that you then spend the time with them listening to what they think. And, and it, it's sort of like, now I'm like, oh, but it's so obvious. And yet it's this kind of almost like prevention versus cure, isn't it? Surely prevention is better than cure, but we still do too much curing. And it's like, surely if you proactive rather than reactive, because if you're reactive, the chances are you're going to get it wrong, uh, both from your point of view and the patient's point of view. And I see it clear as day, but I realise that it's about changing behaviour. And it's interesting, Stephen, that you, you know, you were talking about seeing people in their natural habitat about a month ago, a boiler broke um, at home, in came the plumber. I understand nothing about plumbing. He was fiddling away for about 10 minutes. He came, he came to me, gave me a plain English diagnosis. This is what's happened. 
you know, it, it stuffed, you know, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Plain English summary of the diagnosis. And then he said, here are your options, one, two, three. Here are the benefits and here are the risks associated with these options and here are the costs. What do you want to do? Honestly, it was absolutely perfect shared decision making. It's not an unnatural conversation to have, is it? It's a, it's a, it's a, an everyday negotiation. It feels to me. Alf, tell me about the term "activated consumers." Right, I don't like the idea of con- patients as consumers. I, I really don't. I fervently believe in co-production. I, you know, it, it, we've had far too paternalistic a system for far too long. What I don't want us to move is in the opposite direction towards a consumerist society and you know I genuinely believe that that co-production where we meet in the middle and we share our own expertise is the place to be um however there's been an awful lot of talk particularly in the states about this concept activation and activation is having the knowledge skills and confidence to manage your own health and well and to take part actively in conversations about your about your health um, it came from a colleague of mine, Judy Hibbard, at the University of Oregon, about 20 years ago. I've done some work with Judy on, on activation, but I just don't like the phrase <laughs> consumers because, I, as I say, I fervently believe that it's a conversation between equals that, that comes to the best possible decision um, for both parties. Well, a few years ago when we were doing some work looking at the nuclear system of healthcare, that was that was very fashionable for a while. This um, place in Alaska where... They had a very multidisciplinary primary care model, and they used the word, I think I've got this right, customer owner. So instead of patients, now, I think anyone in the NHS, as, as you just did, Alf, gets antibodies when we start talking in, in those sort of terms. But actually, it was quite a useful phrase because it, I thought it, it in a way, it laid out the relationship quite well in that the, 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 the patient was sort of both a customer and an owner of the service that they were getting. So I'm with you. But I think there is some use in reminding ourselves that the patients aren't just users of the health service. They are the owners of it and the payers of it. But isn't that going back to Graham's point about being project managers? I mean, that's exactly Graham Graham's point, isn't it, from the first episode in, in this series? Yeah, you use the term profit, project navi- healthcare navigator, I think, Alf. I've seen in one of your yeah. writings, some healthcare navigator, which is the same premise, isn't it? Yeah. Can, can I give you two quotes, Alf, that I picked up on Twitter? Look, um, we need to do much more de-implementation, but it's hard. That's one of yours. And agree and would add that confidence to share our reasoning and our uncertainty seems to come with experience slash age. Would be fab to explore this from an ethnographic point of view. Yeah, right. Is it age or is it experience? Yes, yeah, maybe wisdom, isn't it? Somewhere in between age and experience. Um, yeah, that was Richard Lehman who started that. Um, Richard Lehman used to write uh, a wonderful column in the BMJ for many, many years about evidence-based healthcare. Uh, he's a very wise person, and he, it was it was Richard that started that Twitter trail off. Um, we're full of uncertainty, aren't we? We've no idea about healthcare. It makes us feel anxious, you know, as as clinicians. Well, why aren't we much more open with with patients about about? I'll, I'll use the word patient here just to be you know rather people just to be clear. Why aren't we much clearer with people about our uncertainty? I, I must say, you know, towards the end of my clinical career, there was nothing in my head that I wasn't sharing with patients. I wasn't holding stuff back. I was just very genuinely and openly being the person that that was inside my head. With it, them. it does come with, as you say, it's confidence, it's wisdom. I was telling someone the other day about. Uh, being, talking about judges of character and i said the thing is i said when you work in healthcare i worked it out one day roughly i think i've spoken to and helped a quarter of a million people so far in my career and there are only certain you know we've all got values and preferences but there are certain uh, gross types aren't there of of types of people and so if you've had lots of practice at that that's that 10,000 hours kind of thing isn't it it does become easier the more you've done it so whilst earlier i was talking about you know i, I kind of see it and, and and it's easy i guess what i'm saying is that that came through training okay being trained and then being prepared for when people come through the door and and i mm. honestly do believe that but if you haven't got the training and you haven't got the understanding then of course you're going to find it difficult yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I, I would, and if you, if you, if you haven't had the experience of saying to patients, "I don't know," and having the confidence to say it, and realizing that time after time, when you say that, patients genuinely, genuinely, they, they really, 
that, that they get it. <laughs> they really do. They don't go, oh my God, you're hopeless. I, you know, they, they, they kind of generally kind of, they, they will engage in a conversation at a much, much deeper level, I think, if you display that humanity and uncertainty. <clears throat> yeah. Jamie, I'm just going to beat you on your quotes. Well, I think I'm going to beat you on your quotes. In that seminal King's Fund document, how about this? Shared decision-making is the principal mechanism for ensuring that patients get the care they need and no less, the care they want and no more. Who knew that you had Al Murray in your King's Fund document? (laughs) The pub landlord. (laughs) No, it was actually Al Mully. But anyway, he I'm always thinking it as Al Murray when I read it. So along that no more, the de-implementation side of things, Alf, what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's a, it's a rubbish word, isn't it? It really is. Um, <laughs> it's but, like de-prescribing, <laughs> that's a rubbish word too. I, I was looking through some Office of Budget through Responsibility papers. Uh, oh, a few we months haven't back. difficulty sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's boring, isn't it? That is so boring. <laughs> but, you know, people have been saying, why, why does the NHS keep costing more? Why, 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 why? Um, and um, I, I also looked at a fantastic paper. It was called "What Do no- What Do Nobel Prize Winners Ever Done for Us in the HSJ a few years ago." And it was essentially saying that the increasing and spiralling costs in the NHS, the OBR said this, are due to the increasing complexity and intensity of clinical practice. In other words, when we get more research, we add it on to what we're already doing. We don't substitute the new research and stop doing stuff. We just add it on. So we accrete more and more and more and more processes, many of which are low value processes onto the way we go about doing our jobs. So we frankly ought to be de-implementing stuff at least as fast as the, de- the, the rate at which we implement stuff in order to, 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 to maintain some sort of equipoise in the NHS. It, we're just actually, we're burning out our staff. We're doing too much to patients. And there's got to be a time where we just say, look, we're doing, we, we, we've done enough. We've done enough. We've got to start. We've got to start taking an awful lot of stuff off the menu, and we're not doing it. We're not doing it enough. Yeah, I was going to say it's the first first route of process mapping. Really, is is what can we take away? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And one more from me, Alf, before I let Steve come on with the with the, the important bit. But on one of the the groups that we're all on, I think there's that talk of the the time needed to implement. Yeah, right. That, that that debate that's taken place the last couple of months, hasn't it? About that, you know, if we are to follow the guidelines, that actually our clinicians just don't have the time to be able to implement everything that's that's thrown at them. Yeah, it's all the same stuff, isn't it? Um, Twenty seven hours a day. I read from from America. If you used if you did all the American guidance, you'd be spending twenty seven hours a day, seven days a week. Um, yeah, Tim Wilson was the was the the name of the chap who wrote um, a really really good article in the HSJ about four years ago. What have Nobel Prize ever, winners ever done for us? And it, it really is about we're doing too much. We are doing far 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 too much. If you send that to us, we will put it in the show notes. I will do. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill dot com. Okay, excellent. Great chat as ever. Sounds like one of those that we could spend all night here in the pub of the Oral Apothecary, but we must move on. So Alf, one of the benefits of coming on the Oral Apothecary is to give three things. The first one, I'm sure you're aware of this, is a drug that really evokes a powerful memory for you, either from your working life or through your 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 health journey so far. So what would you like to offer us for your desert island drug? Well, it's a class of drugs, and it's pretty boring, I'm afraid, but it's statins. Ooh, it's class statins. of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie will force can you to pick statins? one of them. You can start with statins, and we'll yeah, we'll ask some clever <laughs> questions in a moment, Alf, and we'll get you down to one. So the reason I've chosen statins is I remember I was in Oxford when evidence-based medicine took off in the mid-80s, and we started talking about numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm. I did some work with some people who were running a uh, a, a little magazine called Bandelier. Oh, Bandelier? yeah. Remember it yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Remember it really it well. good, wasn't it? Bandelier was really, really good. And I remember hearing that these new drugs were out called statins. And the number needed to treat was 40. I remember that so well. It was about 1987, something like that. And I remember thinking, why are we giving people drugs if, if you were to give it to 40 people before one gets a, a reasonable effect? Um, and, and we've had that, that debate on and off for years 
years and years, decades, haven't we, about statins. Um, you know, there's the, the the kind of trade-off between, you know, the public health good and the fact that, that you know, until recently, we've not really thought they do that much good on the whole for individuals. Um, it's only a small number of individuals that they do actually help. What I it, it made me really think about statins for this podcast is I've just been sent the new nice decision support tools for statins, and they're a damn sight better than I thought, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and the little Kate slots on there, they do look very much better than I, I actually thought. And it's made me think, God, I think I probably need to do my Q risk again and, and reconsider whether I'll take statins myself. So that's why that's why I bought it up. Lots of kind of stuff. Um, including including Julian's. Julian's. I was going to say, it links yeah, very resource. well to Julian yeah. Treadwell's resource that we mentioned earlier, gpevidence.org. And he tweeted, I think, yesterday to say however many people have looked at it so far. And the three top areas that people have gone to is statins, yeah. anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation, and Louise will be happy, HRT. Those are the three that most people have gone to so far. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, if I tell you that one of the previous guests picked Simva statin, could you pick another statin for us so that you can have it unique <laughs> no. to you? So I'll go a tool for statin in that case. <laughs> okay. It was Mahindra Patel, by the way, who picked Simva statin. Okay. I know. I know the listener was shouting out at their radio. I know we're not on the radio. <laughs> it just shows you that after that, that decision not to take a statin or to take a statin is a dynamic one, isn't it? And it changes. Dynamic. It changes, it? doesn't it? Isn't it? And it makes you think an awful lot about adherence and, and you know, yeah. the difference between preventative medications and, and medications that are used to treat symptoms. Or, yeah, it's all it's very interesting. It can, can trigger a lot of debate. Yeah. And so it's not a once only, is it? That's, you know, it's, 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 oh, I made a decision not to take a statin, then I can't, I can't review that. I can't, I can't change my mind. I can't, you know, th that's important to note, yeah. isn't it? And do you know what? We get that all the time. So, you know, we say to people, Absolutely fine. Here's all the information. Yeah, I've heard what you've said. We'll document that. We can come back to it whenever you like. A week later, I've decided I've changed my mind. <laughs> I will I will go with it. Fine. Absolutely fine. Yeah. It's an old chestnut, but yeah. No Give him permission. Yeah. Okay. A Torvastatin, and yeah, some are probably the most data of any class of drugs yeah, exactly. on the planet. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. Okay. A Torvastatin it is then into the oral apothecary formulary. Well, next up. Alf, I don't know what your musical taste is like, but we take everything on this podcast. It's very eclectic. So what would you like to offer for the Oral Apothecary Spotify playlist? And yes, you know what I'm going to say next. It really is on Spotify. <laughs> um, so two came to mind, but I'm going to I'm going to tell you the one. The two okay. that came to mind are number one, Kashmir by Led Zeppelin. A number of reasons for that. Um, one of which was Robert Plant went to my school. And, uh, um, he's, a lot, he's a lot older than me, um, but he, I, I, he was King Edward VI school in Starbridge. And he was always hanging about around the town centre, driving his silver Aston Martin DB5 when I was a 15, 16 <laughs> year old. And it was quite impressive. So I really got into Led Zeppelin's music and Kashmir is one of their finest tracks. Um, but actually the one I, I, I would take is from Pink Floyd. And it shine on you, crazy diamond. Frankly, wow. just because it's a banging tune and probably the best guitar from Dave Gilmore that I've ever heard. And every time I hear it, look at it, look at it live on Pompeii from a few few years back. It's absolutely blistering. There he was. He was about 73, 74 at the time. Fingers are a little bit on the chunky side, playing like a god. Yeah, there we are. Shine on you, crazy diamond. Wow. Well, go on, James. I know you want to. <laughs> no, not at all. No, no. I just, we're being dom but dominated by Pink I Floyd. I think Pink Floyd has now got the most number of picks from oral apothecary guests. Is that right, Jamie? Yeah. Well, I think we've had Shine on You Crazy Dad. So it's our, it's our first, dupli first duplication, isn't it? Phil Howard yeah. had it. Yeah. Uh, there we go. But we've had, three, uh, we've had three others as well, I think. There's no rules, though. We've got no to take rules. It. Yeah. And it is a great track. Our it very is. good friend of mine, Jamie and I, we've known for 35 years, Darren Cooper. That's one of his favourite tracks as well. So Shine On You, Crazy Diamond, an absolute belter. Excellent. And the third for the Oral Apothecary Library is your book choice for the listener. Well, again, I'm slightly, I'm a bit of a maverick, aren't I? It's actually the Ladybird books. Oh, um, <laughs> you've, got You've, got You've got my attention. You've got my attention. You've got my attention. You're at Jamie's level. <laughs> the reason for that. What about Brexit? Sorry. 
a reason for that. Is it the Slow it's, Fox? It's all the Ladybird books, and I, I, I'll pick one. <laughs> Henry, Henry the Eighth, the Six Wives of Henry the Eighth is the one that comes to mind. But I was, I, I grew up in a very, very poor family, very poor family, and we had no books in the house at all, apart from Ladybird books. And um, it was a council house in the in the Midlands, and um, and you know what? You could you could pick up and you could you could read about the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Then you could pick up another one and and learn about calligraphy. And then you could pick up another one and learn about Polynesia. Caligula. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I mean, just they were incredible. And in fact, I've got a collection of them now <laughs> in my library. Is the magic porridge are, part in there, Alf? Yeah, yeah. That's, and they're still brilliant reads. Absolutely brilliant reads. I commend them. I commend them to this point. Well, I think that's genius. And you're dead right. It's a bit like Horrible Histories. You know why Horrible Histories on the TV was so successful was because, unlike everything, it's a bit like, you know, communicating risk. If You've got to have a, you've got to understand it, but you've got to be able to put it into a format that people, yeah. you know, yeah. can digest. Yeah. So that, that's hey, genius. Maybe we need to write the Lady Bird Book of Medicines. There well, we go. Do you know, I was, I was, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, that is a format that is so engaging. It's a wonder that nobody's really caught on to it now. Yeah, so because the, they have done some modern ones. I was joking, wasn't it? But they've done them. They've, they, they're very tongue-in-cheek, the lots new ones. Parodies, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, lots yeah. of parodies about Brexit and stuff like that. But you're, you're right, Gimmo, because we have talked, maybe it was offline, but about the Haynes Manual is another one, right, that I really like. And and Louise Newson, who's the HR2 guru who we've had on here, HRT, sorry, she's written a Haynes Manual for HRT. And I said to the boys, we should do a Haynes Manual on medicines and, and pres- deprescribing. I, I honestly think that we could get a chapter out of every single one of you that's been on as a guest. So that brings me on to, look, my read for this week was is called MedStrong, okay? And it's from the States, Aging Well Through Deprescribing, by a lady called, pharmacist called Donna Bartlett featuring a five-step medication optimization plan. And it's it's a great read, actually. It's a really good read. And it's not far above Ladybird book level, to be honest with you. You know, it's just, it, it's, it's a bit thicker than a Ladybird book, but it actually talks through in a very, very nice way, uh, aging well through deep prescribing and the whole emphasis and focus on the book. Yeah, it's, it's, worth, it's worth a read. Is it aimed at the public? Yes, but in a in a in a very well, maybe we could plagiarise it and yeah. turn it into the Ladybird books yeah. in the UK. Joking, joking. Yeah, that's a plan. <laughs> that's a plan. Um, Alf, before we go on, look, I, I, I was serious about the question earlier. What would what would be your TED talk if you um if you had to do a TED talk? <clears throat> it would actually be about the application of health psychology to healthcare. And my wife's a psychologist. Many of my best friends are health psychologists. There's this whole discipline of the way we think about, the way we um, understand health, healthcare, and medicines, um, which drives our behaviours, which most of us are not aware of, are not aware of. And frankly, I don't think health is <laughs> They should be promoting this work. They should be promote. But most of my work has been driven by a sort of a, an amateurish understanding of, of health psychology. Um, so it would be about health psychology, although, as I say, not being a health psychologist, I wouldn't do as good a job as some of the people I know who are health psychologists. STC, what would you be? I think we, I mean, we we say that, don't we? we we're not psychologists. We're like COD psychology, but we, we talk about it like almost every podcast, don't we? We talk, we talk about it. So my TED Talk would, would basically be called One Less Pill because... And I'm not just saying this, and I think it's because of my tens of thousands of hours of practice and my attention to detail and my preparation, is that I've always prided myself on that you could pretty much ask me about any patient, and I could probably suggest that at least one less pill that that person needed to take. You know? I don't know. You put me on the spot there. I, 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 there's something about, it's similar to us, really. There's something about how cognitive bias plays into our, into our thinking, because I think we, we underestimate it um and you know so so that that heuristic approach to how we make decisions i think would be mine which actually goes back to alf's very first point when i pushed him about why does he think 
that doctors perhaps are not quite as good, at, you know, on mass as other professionals about moving to shared decision making is exactly is that possibly some of it in relation to cognitive bias as well in that because they've seen the way that they've always done it and therefore it's more difficult to do it because it's it's different as well as the the issue you you raised about you know you, you need to be confident in in and want to be able to offload everything that you know sort of thing i don't know i'm sure that's right i think there's quite a lot of work being done in in general practice around the fact that we what we tend to do is we we tend to prescribe courses of action including medicines that seem to have worked in our own practice and and that's what the bias is it's it's the last patient we saw that did really, really well or really um, impactful in some other way, you remember them and you remember that, oh, I'm a trip to work for them. I'll give it to the next one. Um, yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. So, Jamie, come on. What was your TED Talk? So my TED Talk and my TED Talk has been submitted because I watched TEDx on, on Saturday night in Cardiff. Saturday I, I, knew, I knew you were going to send one in. I could sense it. <laughs> and I thought, right. So mine is Medicines, Rivers and the Sea. And it starts off with, and so I've given them a page and a half of my thoughts of it starts off with the psychology of medicines, and then it finishes with, we know where they end up. Wow. And they end up in our water courses. Like all good stories, you've got a start, a middle, and an end. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, lobbying them at the moment to see if I can get a positive out of them for, for TEDx Cardiff. Let's see if I can, uh, if I can make that happen. It would be, uh, it'd be good to do. Wow. Go for it. We'll see. Okay. Our micro discussion next. Look, we'll, it's the recent article in the Sunday times, the NHS is flatlining. Here's how to save it right now. And we've had contributions from our two previous guests from series five. Graham kicked us off and Deborah. Would you like me to remind people what they said? Oh, go on. So this is the NHS 2023 oral apothecary ingredients for the tonic, the NHS. So Graham actually has got two. He's got support, then trust patients as project managers for their own health and analyze health data more to work out what works and what doesn't. And Deborah Duval gave us treat the person, not the condition. So Alf, did you have a chance to have a look at it and any any I thoughts? Did. And, and and rather boringly, I'm going to say all decisions should be shared. And, you know, what we know is that, uh, broadly speaking, both patients and clinicians overestimate the benefits of medical stuff and, in particular, surgical stuff. Um, so it's both patients and clinicians overestimate benefits and both patients and clinicians underestimate harms. So we're trapped in a bit of a, a bit of a lie about just how great healthcare is. Of course, healthcare does some great stuff, but it's probably not as good as any of us would like it to be. And if we all shared decisions, understood the benefits and harms of the courses and of action available to us, including you know, simple lifestyle stuff, then it feels to me the world would be a much better place and it would cost less. Healthcare would cost less. So predictable, perhaps, but pretty true as well actually if we did share decision making much more healthcare would cost less and that could go to my ted talk because that's a cognitive bias isn't it that that tendency to to overestimate risk and underestimate benefit or was it the way around i can't remember the way around, yeah, yeah. so alf i've been lucky enough to sit in on lots of gp consultations over the years as part of the you know, education and the research agenda and i've watched gps embark on shared decision making and it's become clear that the patient didn't want it how do you what you know if you were running your 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 training sessions what type of conversation would you have for the for the clinicians when they're faced with uh, with that scenario so you know there are some simple little um need a scenario about i don't know medicine or not um let's say medicine surgery or lifestyle shift um and 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 if the patient says ah, what would you do doctor then uh, a, a reasonable response is well i'm not i'm not you um and and um you know what, what i really want to do is to support you to come to the right decision for you so let's look through the benefits and harms together we'll do this together right um <clears throat> so i'm not you is a is a is a i think a reasonable a reasonable response um I'm going to be honest, if, if you've got a stock of half a dozen little kind of neat little responses, you can start to engage people into, into a conversation. What ideas have you got? What thoughts do you have? 
as we think through these options, tell me what comes to mind. Tell me what's going through your head as you're as we're thinking through this together. You can just gently tease people into the into the conversation. And I think it's it's ethically the right it's the right thing to do. You know, I think especially with people with low levels of activation or health literacy, they tend not to have a high confidence in sharing decisions. So having these little phrases, tell me what you're thinking, tell me what's going through your mind. Let's think about this together. <clears throat> just gently coax them, and I think can be really, really helpful. Very good, thank you. So, Alf, what about one other thing that I wanted is is digital consent. Where, what's your appreciation of that at the moment? It's a, it's a great question, isn't it? There's a difference between shared decision making and consent. Shared decision making is the process that may end up in someone signing a consent form, but it is a process. I think some people are starting to conflate. Shared decision making and consent—they're not the same thing. Consent is the is the end of a shared decision making process. It, you know, I think it can be done digitally. It can be done digitally very well, but it's the process beforehand <laughs> that we need to be really, really clear about. And I I am yet to see a digital platform that does the work for us. I still think it's really, really important. That clinicians need to have the skills to have these conversations because there's not very many decision support tools that do an awful lot of the work for us actually you do have to have the conversation skills as well it, we've got digital consent i think it's a good thing but it's the process leading up to it that we need to take care of so so what do we mean by digital consent sorry i'm not sure i i fully understand that phrase so there are a number of digital platforms which um you, know, you can go along to a patient with a with an, an iPad or or do it um, uh, uh, via via the net, um, and and they have got the benefits and harms of the procedure under consideration listed really nicely there, and sometimes they've got options as well alongside it. But the assumption is that the patient is there to sign the, to sign the consent form. So so it's like when I went to Welsh blood when I gave blood and you you fill in an iPad and it asks you all the questions and so it, it cuts out the need for them to have that conversation with you. But actually you just tick in the boxes as quick as possible and sign it without really looking at anything. Is that is that what you mean? It it should it should be there to inform the conversation. It should. It shouldn't just be just something that we send to somebody and say, you know, sign on the dotted line, please. I was just gonna go back to my zoo analogy because I know Jamie loved it so much, is that I think what you're saying is if you're sat in the bed <laughs> and somebody comes and wants you to do that consent that comes up with the iPad and actually like I said before you know you're they're, they're your keeper and you want them to do the operation so I, I think what we're saying is is that a bit me going back to my proactive and reactive is that where possible because sometimes it's not possible but where possible you're providing this information in advance of so that the quality time spent with the health professional is just discussing values and preferences of that person and what you know and how you can help them. In other words, going back to your point about all decisions should be shared. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a beautiful analogy, actually. Don't tell him that, Alf. We'll have this zookeeper <laughs> analogy all the time now. And, and, I, and I didn't want to point out the time, see, but were you doing an impression of David Bellamy? Yeah, you got it. Well done. <laughs> In their own habitat. Stop. <laughs> okay, a big thank you to Al for joining us on the Oral Apothecary for sharing his stories, his Desert Island Drug, his career anthem, and his book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Sean Jennings, a patient from Cornwall who has had first hand experience of the dangers of being over prescribed opioids for chronic pain. Join us next time on the Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn, and you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Gimo now for the final ingredient. Okay, thanks. And thanks, Alf. That was fantastic. Um, and I'm just leading into my final ingredient, wondering how you do shared decision making with a with an app or with a robot. And so do you remember Jamie when we had a play with Chat GPT and we actually asked it about shared decision making? Um and so sorry, Chat GPT, if you've been living in a cave for the last couple of months, is this sort of artificial intelligence that that answers all your questions. And so we asked it about shared decision making, and it was a little bit frightening because it gave a, a textbook answer, didn't it? It could have been, it could have been a paper. I know Steve, you've had less than ideal experience when chatting to it about drugs, um, but there's no doubt that AI 
will play a major role in the future of healthcare. And so the Times last week reported on an app used by carers that's claimed to halve admissions to hospital. Um, it's a technology developed by Carer or Sarah, um, an AI company, and it's been used by care workers carrying out home visits to log key observations on every visit. So they log patients' blood pressure, temperature, age, heart rate, and diet. And so the AI interprets that information, taking into account their medical history. And their research has shown that it can predict who is at risk of having to be admitted to hospital 2.6 times more accurately than a doctor looking at the same information. So this gives the carers an early warning system, alerting them to take such steps as arranging an emergency GP visit or a prescription for antibiotics. Um, it was interesting to me as well because because it, it resonates with some of the work on trigger tools that was done in the NHS in the past, but it seems that the artificial intelligence can do it much better than we were. So Dr. Ben Marathapu, I hope I've got pronounced that right, who's working at a, as an AE doctor on the trial, said it's game changing for the patients we look after who are old and vulnerable. Typically, some would have gone into hospital, some of these would have gone into hospital 10 times a year. And we're saving the government a million pound a day by keeping patients safe at home. So it's just one trial amongst many, but I think it signals what's about to come. It does start to feel like the machines are finally starting to arrive. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. Warning, may colour urine. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by OneLessPill.com, a medicines optimization consultancy. Mm-hmm.